was Monday. I guess God had something in plan or in store for me because uh, Chris was like, hey, I was talking to him, talking to him last Friday. He was like, hey, could you be on standby in case anybody uh, doesn't get back with me? I was like, sure, sure. <laughs> Called on Monday and I'm like, hey, hey, I hope, I hope somebody, I hope you found somebody. <laughs> nah, he didn't. So, <laughs> here I am. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Welcome to Generations. My name is Chris, and um, I'm gonna be sharing my testimony with you. Obviously, like we always know, there's a lot more to the story than what I'm gonna talk about. But this is what I feel like God has chosen for me to talk about. So this is where we'll go. Last year, a lot of you guys know I was in a car accident. Pretty bad car accident. Luckily, I walked away with no issues. Um, I think the, the worst case was like bruising on my collarbone and stuff like that. But if you look at the car, I know we got a picture, but I'm, I didn't ask them to play it or show it, so we're not going to show it. But um, if you want to see it, just get with me. But either way, it was a pretty significant car accident. And a uh, person came over. We were actually leaving here, heading back home. I say we. I was leaving here, heading back home. And a uh, person was, I guess, not paying attention or something. It was a rainy day. And at this curve on Crumbly Road right up the street, um, he came into my lane to try to correct. Ended up overcorrecting and eventually hit me right on the driver's side of the uh, front driver's side. And so told him my car, had issues with that. But um, I was on the phone with my wife. And so driving home on the phone with my wife, and she, she hears me say, Oh, okay. And then I thought he corrected. That's what I thought. I was like, okay, well, we're good. It's okay. I seen him coming to my lane. I thought I thought I seen him getting back into his lane. Well, shortly after that, just literally seconds, milliseconds after that, she hears me yell, and then the phone cuts off on her side. And so, as you know, not mother, but wife, wife instincts kick in. And it's like, Hudson, get your clothes on. Let's go. We got to go. Come on. Come on. And so... <laughs> She gets Hudson up, she runs out the door. I don't know how fast she got there, I swear. It was like the accident happened and two seconds later she's pulling up. Like the, the fire truck's in there trying to block the way. She's like, get out of my way. And she's right around the fire truck. And she, <laughs> she pulls up and getting out of the car just bawling. And I'm, I'm sitting there on the ground just laid out. Uh, not laid out, I don't want it to seem like I was really hurt. So I was, I was sitting down like this, just chilling. Just chilling, trying to compose myself. And the more, I, the longer I sat, the longer I hurt. And here she drives, like right up in front of me, like, oh, I'm about to get shot. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, so, so I'm sitting there, and she gets out. And I do everything I can to get up, sore as heck now, because all the adrenaline's done worn off. And I, I give her a hug. She's bawling. I'm like, I'm okay. I'm okay. Everything's good. And I walk up to the car, and uh, in the back seat I seen my son and I was like not an emotional guy if you know me I'm not an emotional guy I don't cry a lot but when I saw my son it just hit me it was like within seconds just a few seconds this whole accident could have been 10 times worse and he might not be growing up with his father and so that brings me to what we're going to talk about today which is kind of my story and how I feel like I'm the man I am today through God and God's action through other people. And so uh, I'll pray real quick. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, I definitely want to pray real quick and then we'll get started. Father, I thank you for this day. Uh, I pray that you just allow me to get out of the way. Uh, I pray that whatever you have me to tell, that it's what you want me to talk about. Just allow you to enter my body and just allow me to escape. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, be with us as we, we worship you and, and talk about you. For it's your name I pray. Amen. So uh, growing up, I um, had two father figures that I, I had when I was young, stepdad and a biological father. And so to give you kind of a, a little, little story about them, my, step, my biological father, he um, had some issues. He was, he was a drug seller, sold weed. And so, yes, I'm a drug dealer's son. No surprise, right? No, I'm kidding. But um, he sold weed. He had... So his thing was is that I could tell that he loved me. I could tell that he loved me. However, I don't think he really prioritized me. You know, as uh, I guess he did. I guess I'd say it like this: He loved me enough not to show up. So, a lot of times there would be. I told you last time I talked that a lot of times I would, he would call on Friday. Hey, I'm gonna come pick up sport. That was his nickname for me, and he would 
Wednesday, I'm sorry, not Wednesday. So Friday, Saturday, he would call or whatever. Friday night, he would call and say, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it. I'm going to be there tomorrow. And obviously, he wouldn't show up. The story repeats itself. Maybe a few times out of the out of the year, he would actually make it. And so that was my biological father. But my stepdad, on the other hand, he had his own set of issues. Um, he had, he struggled with alcohol. And so um, he wasn't the happy alcoholic. He wasn't the emotional alcoholic. He was the angry alcoholic. And everybody, whenever they get drunk, has a certain tendency that they like to carry around. He was the angry one. And so a lot of times he would lash out. And to be fair, it wasn't just the alcohol that did it. He was just, there was times where he would just be emotional and get angry for no reason. Um, and so growing up, those were the two, the two people that I had to kind of show me what a father was like and what a man was supposed to, how a man was supposed to treat a woman. And so you, you get those, those tapes in your head and what ends up happening is um, you start thinking that that's normal. You know, if you've ever been in a situation like that, I know a lot of us actually turn back around and we're like, you know, dealing with our kids and it's like, man, that sounded just like my mom. That sounded just like my dad. Same thing happens with me. Um, and essentially, so he was, he was an alcoholic. My bi biological father uh, had different priorities. And so statistically speaking, it would have been very easy to end up in their shoes. It would have been very easy to go out sell dope. It would have been very easy to just be abusive. It would have been very easy to just call it quits with life, whatever you want to call it. But God had a different plan for me. So throughout school, one of the biggest tendencies I had, and my mom's in here, so she might be able to attest, I hated homework. Okay. So like I'm talking six, seven years old. I tried to figure out the best way to lie about if I did it already, even though I didn't. If I had any, even though I didn't, or I did and I just didn't want to do it, I just, I always lied about homework. And so I hated it so much. Uh, there was one time that I almost failed a class. I got grounded for nine weeks because of homework. So don't lie about homework, kids. Um, <laughs> but I say all that because as I got older, it was like the stories got more elaborate. The thing about lying is you always got to cover up a lie with another lie. You can't just lie, tell one lie and it's okay. You got to keep on lying and lying. Oh, no, I don't know what happened to it. The dog ate it, you know? But <clears throat> in eighth grade, um, my mom began taking me to church because, you know, most youth groups, it's 18. I'm sorry, 13, not 18. I don't know what youth group that is, but it's 13. <laughs> 13 years old is when you normally are allowed to go to youth. And so my mom was like, you're going because you need it. Uh, and so I started going. And essentially, uh, let's see, we always attend a church. Uh, and I say we as in my mom and my, my children. My, not my children, my mom's children. So me, my brother, uh, and my two brothers, essentially. So um, even going to church, the one thing I found was that my, my friend group, my friend group wasn't the best. It was almost like uh, the, the tapes had started to play, where I was following in my, my, my dad's footsteps. I was, the people that I was hanging around with were obviously not the best. You know that, and something in your gut tells you that, but you ignore it because you're like, I got to be cool. I want to stand out. I want to make a name for myself. I don't know why I did that, because I was not even anywhere close to being a popular kid. But um, so in eighth grade, going to youth, I tried out for the football team. And in eighth grade, I was probably like five, eight, soaking wet, maybe weighed 135 pounds. And you can imagine some of the bigger guys on the football team, they had to take it easy. You know, I remember one time I was actually, so I tried out for the football team, I made it. And I remember one time we started summer workouts. And, you know, you start lifting when you go to summer workouts, okay? So it's, I never lifted a single single pound in my life that was intentionally like a workout so I'm sitting there with the the lot the starting running back and the starting tight end most of the time those are some of the two biggest people when it comes to skilled players it's the running back and the tight end and they throw on like 35 pound or 45 pound plate on each side and I'm like okay that's not a lot of weight it don't look like a lot they're moving it easy it don't look like a lot so I said all right pull that off and put two 25 pound plates on each side and I get down, unrack it, and as soon as I unrack it, 
right on my chest. <laughs> Embarrassing as heck. I'm like, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. <laughs> Just a little side story for you, some humor. But August 15th, uh, we had our first scrimmage. And so uh, all that working out, I eventually got to where I could do that, barely. Still had to struggle, but barely got it. Um, but essentially, we got ready for the game. It was August 15th. It's a scrimmage game, so you know, you're keeping up with the score, but who really cares because it's a scrimmage because it don't matter if you win or lose, except just bragging rights, that's about it. And so August 15th was our first scrimmage. The day after that, we're tired, go home. I'm sorry, went home the day before that, which was August 15th. The day after that, came home um, and ended up getting some rest. Uh, about, I will say about lunchtime, me, my stepsister at the house, and my brothers, um, both my brothers, which were much younger than we were, they, we were all chilling at the house. My mom was in school. Stepdad was, I think, asleep in the back or something. And our pastor at the time comes up, knocking on the door. He's like, uh, is, is Beth here? And we actually, so the pastor at the time was our cousin. And so we knew, we knew of him. It was like, no, nah, nah, she's not here right now. She's at school. And so she, he just said, okay, and he left. Uh, shortly after that, um, I remember my dad leaving. We went outside and sat. We were at an apartment complex. They had this gazebo. So we went outside, and that was a chill spot. You know, all the kids came out and just relaxed. So that's where we were chilling at, and I saw our dad leave. And shortly after that, a few moments, a few hours after that, I should say, um, we get a call saying that, uh, our grandmother's passed away, and so essentially she started bawling and, and crying, and we end up at her house uh, because they had to, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think my mom had to identify the body or something like that. But um, so we show up at her house, we're outside, and we're sitting in, in school. I mean, sorry, not school. We're sitting in a, a group of us. There's my sister, my family. Um, my stepdad, I think, had just dropped my mom off and left. And I just felt led to pray. I uh, don't know what it was, but I just felt led to pray. And so uh, something along the lines of like, thank you, God, for this time that we had with her. And uh, just thank you for, for all the times that you've given us, all the moments you've given us. And I pray that whatever comes with this, that it, that it be your will, that you, you, just, you just have your way in this moment. And so um, we went to the funeral. She had a pretty large funeral. It was a long long procession is that what it's called procession so after the fact I mean we 42 we were there's a long stretch on uh 16 I think is it 16 or 30, 36 I can't remember 16 um from and it's right from shallow to uh this curve going right up towards Ingalls in Jackson and essentially all the cars were backed up to that point so she she had a, a very influential uh spirit and um I just couldn't understand like why why God would let such a, a, a lovely woman go, uh, especially considering that she was my grandmother. But it, looking back, God knew what he was doing. God had a plan. And so um, I noticed that as time went on shortly after that, so I'm still in ninth grade, 14 years old, um, my friend group has started to change. You know, I told you I was hanging out with some of the, the wrong crowd. Um, and I, I noticed that something within me has started to change. I don't know if it was just just coincidental, me trying to cope with things, just trying to disconnect from, from people. Uh, but it seemed like as I removed people from my life that there were other people that were actually a little bit more better for me, much better for me in some cases. And so that's where I started to notice like changes within myself to where I felt like God was slowly leading me towards a path of making me better instead of instead of me going down the wrong path and following my dad's footsteps or my stepdad's footsteps. Um, so let's see. There was a couple that I met at the funeral. Or I thought I met. I'd seen them before, but they were kind of new faces to me. I had never seen them at my grandmother's funeral uh, until I went to my grandmother's funeral. And so what I, as, as time went on, they actually they had started, they had took, taken over the youth group at the church that we were attending. And so this couple needed, they, they asked if I could help with car washing, cutting the, cutting the grass, doing, doing car washes for them. It's not like they really needed it. Their cars were older. They didn't really care about how they looked. They just trying to get me, you know, help me 
make some money. That was about it. But um, essentially, as time grew on, I, they started to spend more and more time with me. Um, this couple to me was like, especially growing up, I had seen where they, they were what I would personify as a, a, a godly couple, a Christ-like couple. Uh, the man at the center of the household and, and, and the woman is, they, they just love each other. They're, they're, they seem happy together. And so that's what I had seen as I grew up with them as opposed to what I had seen growing up in my house. And so it was two conflicting, two conflicting uh, uh, stories. And so it was, it was different because I had never really seen where a, a woman was treated with so much respect as opposed to, like I said, in my house. And so after about a year of knowing this couple, I actually discovered that they're the ones that found the, the body of my grandmother. Um, my, I guess it would be my step-grandfather was actually friends with him and asked him to go check the house because uh, he couldn't get in contact with him, with her, and he traveled a lot for his job. And so I discovered, I discovered that they're the ones that found my grandmother, and through that, I feel like God was able to use her death to bring me to what I would consider a, a man should look like, a, a, a Christ, Christ-like man should look like. And through them, I actually learned a lot of what it takes to be respectful, to be com to how to communicate, um, how to respect my wife, and how to show her that I love her um, without just going and buying a gift, because that don't always work, as you know. Uh, <laughs> it does if you're in really, really deep trouble sometimes. But <laughs> So in Proverbs 4.11, uh, it says, I have directed you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in upright paths. And so what I look at is like through, through the, my grandmother's passing and seeing that I had a choice to make between following the same ways that I was doing, I feel like at the point that my grandmother passed was that what I would call a watershed moment where I had to decide if I was just going to sit here and curl up into the fetal position and let this defeat me or if I was gonna actually go out and change something about myself. And I believe that God started changing that with the friend groups and eventually brought them into my life. Uh, without them, I would actually venture to say that I probably would not be standing here right now. Uh, I'm extremely certain that without seeing what a Christ-like man is supposed to look like, that I would not be here right now. And so, so the, Pretty much, I, I learned a lot from them. Two years after that, two years after that, I was a junior in high school, and I'd seen this, this really cute, cute girl. And I was like, all right, all right, I'm on. I was shy, so I didn't really talk to a lot of girls. Only girls I talked to were ones that were my friends, and I, put, I was putting the best friends on, okay? So I was like, all right, I'm gonna go talk to this one. And she's sitting on a bench, and I see her, try to get, I muster up the courage, I start walking that way, and she gets up and walks off. I was like, God. <laughs> she plays softball, and so the bus had gotten there, she had to go, play, go to the softball uh, bus. And so, yep, I was like, okay, well, I guess it is what it is, we'll leave it alone. About two weeks after that, I get a text. I'm sitting, the way it worked was I got off of school, um, you know, approximately like three o'clock and went to my went to my mom's work, walked up there, which was like half a mile up the street and sat in the car and waited on her. I go inside sometimes and I was sitting in the car and I got a text from somebody and I was like, who who is this? And they said, my name is Heather. Like, OK, my name is Chris. No, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But uh, I was like, OK, who are you? And then they sent a picture. I was like, oh, that girl. That's who I was going to go talk to. They stalked me and got my number off Facebook, just so you know. So don't put your number on Facebook unless you're trying to meet your wife. I'm just saying. <laughs> In 2015, we got married. Um, and at that time, I instantly became an old man at the age of 22. And my hair soon followed, just so you know. But uh. In 2018, we welcomed our son um, to the world, Hudson. 
handful. He was screaming this morning. I was about to wear his butt out, but it's okay. I didn't. I let Jesus take the wheel on that one. But once again, we have another, also, we have another one on the way, too. So we have two lovely children. We've got to figure out what the, the next one's going to be. But essentially, I say all that because throughout my relationship with her and my relationship with my son, I've seen that God's path led me there through, through me being obedient to what he wanted. It got me to where I could be a faithful man to my wife and a, a loving father. And I just couldn't imagine the, what the outcome would have been like had, not, had God not intervened and put this couple in my life. Um, and I'm not saying it's just a couple. It's just that is what God used to turn my life around. There's a lot more that I could talk about, and maybe someday I will get the chance to. I'm very certain that if anybody else drops out of the, uh, the picking, that I'll, I'll be back up here again. But, uh, but um, I truly believe that that, is, that was God working. That is how God moved in my life. I would challenge you when we leave here, whenever you are going through a, hard, a hardship, uh, something that's, that's challenging, um, I would challenge you to take a step back and pray for patience, pray for peace, and most importantly, look to God for guidance. Um, Because in every situation, he's sitting there leading you. You just got to follow. You just got to look. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. I thank you again for the time that you've given me to just talk about my story. And while there's so much more we could talk about, God, I just pray that whatever I talked about today, that, that whoever needed to hear something like this, that they, they received it well and that they're able to walk away with something um, other than just words. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for sending your son to die for us for us and our, our, our sins. Thank you for everything that you do. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. It's hard to follow that up. That was great. I know it was good. So, um, once again, I am Pastor Becca, and you know, this series has, has been a focus point on testimonies and seeing what God has done and moved in people's lives. And hearing Chris's testimony and knowing that it takes a village, I mean, it really does. And sometimes as parents, the only thing you can do is, is beg a youth group, please take this child before I go to jail for this child or own this child. And and as Chris spoke, I mean, the youth groups were, I mean, we had the awesome privilege of having Miss Amy, and she just took my girls right under her wing and loved them like nobody's business. And it's such a testimony to when you depend on other people, when you link arms and we come together as a united front. I mean, I'm looking out, I got, you know, Chris and Ashlyn and Emily and, and Cody and Jacinta and Adam, all these people and Taylor and all these people that were these little kids. And this whole village just surrounded them. I mean, Taylor, we were praying for you for two years before you even walked through the door. <laughs> and it, it's just... Those type of things, when we all come together and link arms and raise these children up, and now we have this whole new generation. We've got Hudson and we've got Briley, and it's, it's a hilarious because Hudson follows Judah, and Judah goes, no, no, and Brinson follows Hudson, and Hudson goes, no, no. <laughs> but you see it come into fruition. It's all this wonderfulness of us all together, and, and Chris will tell you we all parent the same kids. There's a rule, you beat all the children. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) But it does, it does take a village. And so we're thankful that all of you are part of our village. And I am honored to be called Lolly and Mom by most people. So just a few quick announcements this week. We have a lot going on coming up in the month of October. We are going to do our very first ever not so spooky Halloween here at the church. It's going to be exciting. We're going to do a lot of carnival games here in the room. It's going to be really, really cool. We are taking donations. There will be a sign-up sheet posted in the children's room. And we are taking donations for candy, 
all kinds of things to make fun times. This is going to be a time where we can open our doors and really bless the community by having something fun for kids, safe place to go. They're not in a parking lot. It's a well-lit room. We'll have tons of fun right in here, so we need your help on that. We have, I didn't bring a bulletin. Does anybody have one I can steal? (laughs) Adam. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I wasn't prepared. I had one, and I think I lost it. Okay. So we're continuing with my Jesus story. We have one more testimony next week. And if anything happens, Chris will be doing the part two. (laughs) Just saying. And then we also have, on October 2nd, this is your next opportunity to bring a friend to church. We're starting a brand new series. And we're going to cook out. Which is always good because food food unites people. If you hang around in my house for two seconds, I'll ask you if you've eaten. And if you don't eat, then I'll ask you again until you eat because I am my mother's child. This is a great opportunity to bring people to. We're going to cook out. Um, Dale is cooking this time. We're letting David have a day off. Praise God. But Dell is going to be cooking for us. So this is a great opportunity. If you have someone who is on the fence, they just don't know about church, they'll eat a hamburger, bring them on. All right? Finally, nothing in this world is possible without support. I said it takes a village. It really does take a village. So this morning, just with open generosity, Open hands change the world. We truly believe that. And we have seen every time we have a car wash, somebody in need shows up. Every time we have a car wash, we see people come through the doors. Every time we have ice cream, we've got people coming in here. Maybe they just need prayer. Maybe they need their power bill paid. But it's your generosity that funds that. It's when Daryl's standing on the side of the road yelling car wash and Jacinta follows up with yelling car wash. And we have all these people come through. Those are the moments that matter. When we can give back to our community and really lift somebody out of a bad situation, those are the moments that matter. So if you came prepared to give, you can give in the bucket. You can go online to generations.church. You can give there. You can text the numbers on the back of the screen. I hope they're back there. (laughs) But we, we... It does take a village. I I say that all the time, but I'm glad that you all are my village. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for all that you have given to us and will give to us. Father God, we just ask that you continue to anoint us, empty us of us, so that when people see us, they only see Jesus. Let your spirit flow among us in your precious and holy name. Amen. If it's your first